Uh, you recognize my accent. This is a Canadian accent. <laughs> so, so today I will just give you in 15 minutes some glimpse about what I'm doing and how important that we spend time together. When I say together, not only a researcher, but clinician, but having patients as a partners. And I will give you a good example, what type of partnership that bring new innovation. So we need patients not only as a participant, but as a partners. So here are my disclosures. So I'm very fortunate to be supported by the Sibila SA Foundation. So as you know, it's uh, very difficult to be funded in the United States. It's the same in Canada. And we have some bad story that we had lately with CHR. And I was uh, really deeply involved because I was one of the lead PI on that. But the good news is CHR is very sensitive. So things will change, OK? And it's already changed. So, so don't worry about that. I'm very confident. So, so the goal, and it's a very bold goal, is of course to uh, identify and characterize the changes that are occurring uh, and how can we explain the pathophysiology of MECFS. And to identify genetic variant or the genes that can predispose to MECFS development as well as to as a first goal to really develop a diagnostic, prognostic blood test. So something as very simple that can be used for clinicians to better stratify patients and eventually used to uh, work towards the selection of therapeutic group to improve symptoms and eventually cure ME-CFS as soon as possible, okay. So this is a cartoon that just explained to you the different homic approach, approaches. So often we refer to genomics, and this is, as in a very simple term, is what could happen, okay? And this is already a whole cartoon, so we don't have 40,000 genes. We have closer to 22,000. Uh, it's still a lot to watch, okay? And after that is the transcriptomics. So when we translate the blueprint in something that will lead to the formation of different proteins, so what is often referring to that, what is happening? Ultimately, we have to look about the protein and because there's different events that will lead to different form and subtype of protein and modification. So this is probably what is causing at some point MECFS, like any complex diseases. Okay, but we don't know yet what are the type of the protein and you may have enough of one protein, but the protein may be at the wrong compartment in the cells, okay? This protein can go in the nucleus where she should be at the membrane. So there's a lot to explain. And you learn a lot about the metabolomics. So, which is either the resulting of whatever is happening during uh, your, your, your metabolism. And also those small molecules can have also a feedback effect and may trigger changes as well. So it's not just a hand product, but it could be a causal product as well. And you see the complexity, and eventually when we understand clearly what are the good biomarkers, can we uh, develop animal models? So you, you saw some example, uh, so, so, but we don't know yet. We cannot start with animal model without knowing what are the key genes, what are the bad proteins, and how can we manipulate them. So just to add um, another layer of complexity, not only we, we, we have to deal with complex genetics, but also with protein, but everything is also linked with the environment. And for most, if not whole complex disease, we have to take in account this crosstalk between genetics and environment. And the best example that I can share with you is the caterpillar and the butterfly. So you see I'm working in a pediatric hospital, so I have to keep it simple. If you isolate the genomic DNA of the caterpillar and the butterfly, it will be the same genome, more or less. Of course, if you use sophisticated tool, you see more methylation and something probably in the butterfly that can explain why some genes are turned off and why other turn on. But how you become from a caterpillar butterfly, you are exposed to different temperature changes, luminosity, through the chrysalid, and eventually you become a butterfly. So very important step, but blindly, if I give you the DNA, you cannot say who is a caterpillar, who is a butterfly. So we cannot just purely 
and only relate on genomics. We need to address that. And this is particularly important for MECFS. So MECFS, the elephant in the room. So of course, as a researcher, we have different or favorite part of the elephant. Somebody, even blindly, you will go for the trump. You can go for the tail. You won't see Dr. Navio on that one because he's already inside the elephant. Okay, to have a closer look on the mitochondria. The take home message here is we're not flying blindly. The take home message is we're covering all together the elephant. This is a premiere and the last two days was, were very important. We are covering the elephant. But we have to deal with different type of elephants. Okay, so this, this is why the subtyping and, and I have this discussion with Bob. In fact, we should eventually replace the S in CFS, not to use as a syndrome, but spectrum. Probably we will closer to the reality of what is really happening. So I, I won't be the one that decide that, but eventually we will forge a consensus. And uh, I think that we'll, we'll, uh, we have to learn from other diseases like autism that make a lot of sense. So, how can I manipulate your environment knowing that you may or not have genetic predisposition? So I have several discussions with patients, and this is a test that I have developed with some patients. And I would just say his first name, Christian, many thanks for your, I know he's watching, okay, many thanks for your help, okay, and comments. So we developed what I refer to as stress test. To perform the test, we need to figure out something that will be easy to perform. And three quarter of the patients that we have tested so far are housebound. So there's no way that they can go in the clinics or go in the lab to do the test. Even that, this is so stressful that they cannot achieve that. So we use what we refer to a therapeutic massage machine that you have an inflatable cuff that apply to one arm and that give you a very gentle pulse. It's certified to do therapeutic massage. So you see 0.006 Hz with zero to four PSI is very therapeutic. But this is, trust me, this is very enough to create a stress. So we did about 200 individual and we use also age and sex match control to really establish the value. And we start to measure different molecules and including also one of my favorite one is the circulating microRNA that I will talk to, to you in a few seconds. So we start before stimulation and up to 90 minutes. And we draw blood and we keep the cells for different type of assay. So this is the reported side effect following the test from the patient. So one third of the patient have no symptom. We're happy about that because we want to have a safe test and there's no way that we would like to call 911 every time we have to, to do the test because this is the clinical nurse going at home doing the test. But nevertheless, two thirds of the patients report significant side effects that are connected with MECFS. I would just give you an example, the mental fogginess, 12% of them, just by receiving a gentle massage. So that's mean a lot. If we go a bit further about do we develop post exhaustional fatigue following the test, again, 24% patient report no effect. But you see the other one that severe fatigue exhaustion that may st stand for one, two, up to three days. So the test is really creating a stress. And we think that this is the safest way that we can provide that in a very standardized ma manner that we can apply to everyone. If I put you to do some exercise on the treadmills with a view to, view to max, probably I might have different results depending on your capacity. But this, you lay down, put the machine, have a nice discussion with the clinical nurse, and the machine is doing the rest, and your body is doing the rest also. So, no, 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 not, nothing too dangerous that might happen, and we are sure that we are 
that we can reproduce the test every time. So what we learned from that? First, we look on different biochemical factor. I would just mention one. Uh, the colors are for something. So in 20% of the patient, so one in five, uh, the brown one, we saw that higher plasma homocysteine level, so which is a bad molecule, okay, and it's not specific for MECFS, it's something that we shouldn't have at that level, so 30 micromolars, and that matched the most severely affected MECFS patients. Secondly, we measure what through different questionnaires that indeed those patients have the lower physical capacity and higher post exertional malaise. What is new is, and that's why I call we rediscover it, is because Reglan 20 years ago, pay attention about homocysteine. He found out some elevation in cerebrospinal fluid, but not in the plasma. One of the problems that we encounter is the fact that most of the study, for different reasons, including lack of funding, work on very small cohort. So if you have 20 patients, one in five, so you will have very few patients. You would think that this is abnormal, this is an outlier, I will remove it from my study. So having more than 100 patients, now we start to see something. And for us, it's a good point to start having the most severely affected patient. Now, because some of you may be severely affected, there is no mean or automatic mean that you have high level of homocysteine. So don't go directly to your physicians tomorrow. But it's something that we should pay attention. Because we can work and there are drugs and diets can, that can help you to modify your level of homocysteine. So this is something that can be actionable. But we, na we need to be wise and to really understand what are the cause. And this is why we are uh, continue to study that. So high level of homocysteine, and this is a very small uh, chemical entity, is very important because it's connected with different things. You heard that mitochondria uh, dysfunction, so there is a, a, a connection there. There's also a problem with other signaling receptor concentration. So I think it's molecule that is worth to pay attention, and at least for the most severe one, without knowing the cause of that, we should simply have a, this biochemical test. We look also for different vitamin as a cofactor because the pathway leading to high level of homocysteine involves different vitamin. We didn't find any lack of deficiency in vitamin even in the most severely affected patient. The only things that we recently, in a week, I mean, a week ago, is that we find in, in men with high homocysteine, we find a, a, a deficiency in vitamin C. We don't know yet if it's a diet deficiency or if it's in the capacity to transport the vitamin C inside the cells to be used. And there is a strong literature about the link between lack of vitamin C and homocysteine. So we are continuing to exploring uh, that link. So to, to keep it a, a simple explanation, we need to figure out if we have mutation in some key metabolizing enzyme that will prevent the degradation of homocysteine as well as we are looking, especially for the vitamin C, if some key transporter can be uh, mutated and preventing or reducing the capacity to uptake the vitamin C. The third target that are, I have a lot of interest is the uh, circulating microRNA because microRNA are small non-coding RNA that can target different genes and prevent the production, the production of proteins. So, we find out 32 circulating microRNA, and obviously this kind of what I'm referring to, uh, very colorful carpets, give you just an, an idea about the changes. So if you look about the first line is MECFS stimulate uh, 90 minutes compared to control, you see you don't have exactly the same color, so you, you don't see the same intensity on the expression. So more red, it's high, highly expressed, blue is uh, downregulated. So we are looking about that and of course we are looking at different profile at baseline. Our claims, and this is what we are testing right now on a large scale validation, is we think that the stress activating, so the one that we see the profile after the stimulation, 
will reveal more the real events behind the pathophysiology of ME-CFS, and that can be highly reproducible as opposed to patients at different baseline level because patients are coming at different time of the day, they have different diet, they have different profile in terms that early on stage of the disease versus late stage. Sometimes they have using just up to nine different medication. So, so it's very hard to really consider all those events. So that's why we need to have a standardized stress test to make a difference and apply the same thing to everyone to see what is the real pictures that we have to deal with. The last part, and some of you are in the room, and I'm very happy to meet you for the first time because we used to talk by phone and by email, is to study identical twins but that, that are discordant for the disease. So one twin is, is, is affected, not the other one. And we are looking through a whole exam to the genomic data, and we secure so far 12 couples in the world. So we have people from USA, Canada, Scotland, we have from New Zealand, Australia, so wonderful response. And I just want to thank you to the bottom of my heart to your support. You don't know me, but I'm engaged myself and my team to serve you and to figure out what is wrong with you guys. So many thanks for your trust. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the participant, the patient and your family, the uh, Quebec Association for Myalgic uh, uh, Encephalomyelitis, as well as the, the national level MEFM and another uh, Action CIND. The last two organizations were very helpful to at the international level to organize and recruit those uh, monozygotic or identical twins for uh, that part of the study. And also I would like to thank my uh, team members, the working bees. So uh, without them, I won't be here today <laughs> to share with you what we are doing. So again, uh, many thanks uh, for uh, your listening this uh, beginning of something nice story. Thank you. <laughs>